Hello, everybody. I'm back. It's me, the Nutty Professor, and I'm back slightly different format. Now, originally, my former student, uh, who is now my producer and my editor, he used to tape, and this was before um, COVID. And I don't know if there's an official categorization, classification, designation system. Um, I've heard some people say before Corona, after Corona. But I've come up with my own little um, uh, classification system, the Nutty Professor uh, designation. And in it, we have BCC, which is before coronavirus COVID. Then we've got, and I've got the extra C to differentiate from the other BC. So, uh, and then we have uh, current times, DCC, during coronavirus COVID. And then what we're all looking forward to, ACC, after coronavirus COVID. And there will be an after, so we were all anticipating it. So, um, A, um, in uh, BCC, before all of this, uh, my uh, former student, uh, now producer, uh, would um, tape on his 4K camera and I would go there or he would come here. But uh, once this has started, DC, once during started and uh, isolation and all of that, we uh, switched to my taping on my phone and sending it via email and he, he instructed me how to do that via text and I was able to do it and um, now he has come up with another possible solution which is for me to use my uh, the webcam function on my uh, laptop and he showed me uh, via text he took pictures of his thing and he sent it to me and he gave specific instructions and um, uh, I'm trying it out so if you are watching this it means it's worked. And there's still another step. I also have to email it to him. So let's see how this goes. Um, but um, um, and then when ACC, after all of this, we're going to go back to his uh, taping uh, properly with the 4K and everything. Now, uh, talking about all of this, it reminded me of um, the term, and I used this with a, another former student of mine. Uh, she's out in Manitoba, and I connected with her on Facebook, and then I deactivated my Facebook. It's just not my thing. But um, we exchange emails now, and I did uh, tell her in an email that I am, I consider myself a Luddite. And she knew what it meant. Uh, some people do, and these days, uh, most people, I think, do. Some don't. So I will define it here. Um, but uh, she actually questioned me. And she said, I don't think you are as much of a Luddite as you're claiming because you know how to attach pictures. I, in my emails, I attached cat pictures and car pictures. And she goes, you know, you're not a total Luddite. And I said, um, I, uh, I learn what I need to learn to get by. Now, just to define the term, and those of you who are not familiar with it, Luddite actually refers to people who are resistant to or opposed to new technology. I'm not opposed to it, you know. Uh, I just learn, as I said, what I need to learn and no more, you know. Uh, so I knew how to send audio tapes. Now, hopefully, I'll know how to send um, a videotape. And I do know how to text. Very important these days, you know. Without it, I would have been lost. Uh, I do know how to email. I can do attachments. Um, I couldn't do attachments and stuff in Facebook, and that was just too much effort to learn. And then it was more too social for me anyway. Not quite my thing. You know? So, um, and you may not be familiar with uh, the origin of the term Luddite. It actually came from the early 1800s in England. And um, there is a group of rebels who uh, were really upset uh, at uh, possibly losing their jobs. Actually, definitely losing their jobs uh, uh, due to uh, industrialization and machines. These are the textile um, workers. They were afraid that they were going to lose all their jobs because of the new technology and machines, um, textile machines. So they rebelled and they went around smashing machines, you know, and they were executed for breaking up machines. But uh, they went around uh, smashing machines and you know, we've come to say, we've come to use the term people who are uh, resistant to technology or 
opposed to technology, call them Luddite. Uh, there's a story about a, a supposed General Ludd, but that's fictional. They kind of made it up afterwards. I don't think there was an actual General Ludd, as far as I know. Um, now, um, in terms of um, uh, technology, uh, a couple of days ago, I finally uh, and people have been telling me for this for a long time that I should do this, but I finally signed up for Netflix. And uh, I uh, can watch it now on this laptop, and I can watch it on my phone. I can't watch it on my TV because my TV isn't smart enough. So when all of this is over, ACC, I have to go out and buy a smart TV. You know? uh, and uh, the first uh, series that I've been watching is uh, Narcos. Nar uh, you know, I figured I'd, wa I'd watch a, a, a program about <laughs> drug trade in South America. So, um, uh, the next thing I actually wanted to get into was to go back to existentialism. We've talked about it in the last couple of podcasts, uh, Camus and the plague. Not surprisingly, um, there's been a resurgence of interest, um, sort of a revival of uh, uh, existentialism. And a lot of people are now discussing Camus, particularly because of the plague, the book that he wrote, that was very prescient, you know, and really applies to our times. And um, I think people have also started getting back into existentialism because the movement of existentialism, the philosophical school, it dealt with looking for meaning um, and, you know, uh, facing death, looking for meaning, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the inevitability of death. And these days, a lot of people are sitting at home, not working or, you know, a different setting, and they're thinking more about, you know, meaning and what's important and, you know, and uh, giving their life meaning and about death. You know, there's a very big thing now in terms of one's own mortality and you know, trying to save other people's lives, you know. And it's not, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, um, existentialism itself, that the original movement, it came out of World War II, you know, and, and these people were, you know, they were involved in all of that, uh, Sartre and Camus. Now, a um, couple of things I wanted to say here, you know, the um, a point I wanted to make is that existentialism is not nihilism. And that is a mistake that I made myself when I first came to it in my late teens, early 20s. It's a mistake a lot of young people make. And I equated existentialism with nihilism. Nihilism means nothing matters, so you can do whatever you want. You know, um, but um, existentialism, what, what they were saying, what Camus was saying was that meaning is not inherent, you know, and this is particular in this, in their branch, in the uh, atheist branch of existentialism. There was also religious branch, I mentioned it before, uh, main proponent uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, and he, he uh, said, however, that you had to take that leap of faith you know, and these people, they they kind of go, you know, you don't need to make that leap of faith, but you need to um, uh, find meaning. You have to give meaning, you know, in the face of absurdity. And that's another term of theirs that uh, if meaning isn't automatic, it is, if it's not given, then in a, uh, you know, a rational person, if you're thinking rationally, in a sometimes irrational world. And we'll be talking about toilet paper and stuff later. But in an irrational world, if you're being rational, stuff is going to seem kind of absurd. And in my uh, Nutty Professor framework, we've talked about how before, before all of this, we talked about the Nutty Prof, the Crazy Prof, and maybe the Psycho Prof, which I was trying to avoid, you know? Um, and in a way, I said before that uh, when people today say, oh, we live in crazy times, in a way, it's uh, an acknowledgement of what uh, uh, the existentialists said in terms of things seeming uh, meaningless at times because we're not used to them and we have to we have to we have to change your way of thinking. You know, so the whole absurdity in the face of you know so-called nothingness. You know, now um, the um, the that actually led me to something else because uh, I, uh, I I did have a dream. And I've talked about uh, dreams before that I'm in Jungian analysis and I uh, discuss dreams with my analyst. Uh, and I've switched technologies with him. I, I used to see him in 
in person for our sessions but then um, our first um, DCC session we tried on FaceTime I have an old iPad which I bought only to communicate with my parents in India and they're even more Luddite than I am so somebody has to somebody gave them an uh, iPad but somebody has to turn it on for them and somebody has to answer it they can't answer the the, the smartphone you know however I mean they're in the late 80s yeah you know so um, but um, I bought an iPad a used iPad and I tried a, a, a FaceTime session with my analyst uh, first time it worked Second time, you know, uh, was not connecting and it kept going off, kept going off. And he's even older than I am. So in the end, we both said, let's just talk on the phone <laughs> with a telephone session, you know. So, um, but in, in the sessions, we did talk a little bit about the dreams. And, and I did have a dream about uh, oh, uh, previous vehicles or cars that I've owned or my family's owned. And symbolically, that's what were my previous vehicles, ways of getting around, you know. So, um, and... And I had another dream uh, right at the start of all of this, at the cusp between uh, BCC and DCC. I had a dream about uh, being in a movie studio in uh, Europe and uh, taking over the studio or something. And there was a, but the main, the important um, part of the dream for us is I uh, met a famous uh, European uh, actor, Max von Sydow. And I didn't know this, but he died around that time. I only found out a couple of days ago. Yeah, but uh, he was a very famous actor. He starred in some Swedish films to start with, Igmar Bergman in them. And later on, he went on to uh, uh, do English films and Hollywood. And he was even in uh, Star Wars, in The Force Awakens, you know, about five years ago. Now, um, Igmar Bergman, Swedish director, very dark, very depressing, very brooding. And um, a, lot, uh, a lot of his films deal with death and, uh, you know, meaning and, you know, and he himself, um, his, uh, I've read his uh, autobiography and some biographies of him, and he, uh, his stepfather was very stern, he was a pastor, you know, and there was a clash because, he, you know, his uh, biological father had been an actor and very easygoing and there's all kinds of stuff going on there. But anyway, uh, there, there was a film by Ingmar Bergman, uh, 1957, before I was born, but I saw it when I was in my 20s, and it it was called The Seventh Seal, and it starred Max von Sydow, you know, and in the movie, Max von Sydow plays a, uh, a knight uh, who had come back from the Crusades in the medieval times, and he was kind of a dissolution, kind of an existentialist knight. He comes back, uh, um, and there's a plague! In the uh, uh, in the area where he has his castle, and uh, people start dying, and uh, plagues, I guess, on a lot of filmmakers and writers and books, you know, use it as a metaphor. So um, there's a plague and death. The Reaper, you know, with the uh, with the with the thingy, you know, the Grim Reaper, uh, with the scythe, comes to take um, the knight away, and uh, the knight uh, makes a strikes a bargain. He says, you know, they do, they decide to play chess and for his life, and if the knight wins, he gets to live. Kind of like Reaper Sisyphus making deals with death. So you got the knight uh, playing chess with death. And in the end, death wins, you know? So he takes away um, the, the knight and the people that were at his uh, castle. And uh, the very famous last scene, they're like going away up up a hill and you can see uh, uh, the, the Grim Reaper with the side and all these people are kind of dancing, the dance of death as they're following in the afterlife, you know? So um, um, th that whole thing in terms of, you know, uh, death is coming up in all kinds of, you know, um, symbols and stuff, you know, and um, uh, Thanatos. We've talked about Thanatos before, you know, uh, the god of death, remember, the uh, great god of death with uh, with Sisyphus and Thanatos and Eros in terms of uh, Freud. Uh, one final thing I wanted to say about uh, Thanatos is there is also a, um, uh, a psychological concept, thanatophobia, which is the fear 
of death, uh, phobia of death. And I had it when I was a child. I would walk way miles out of my way to avoid going past a cemetery. You know, and I, I wasn't a kid that liked walking a lot, but I would walk way out of my way to avoid a cemetery. I would also, if there was a dead fly in a room, I couldn't go in the room. Somebody had to go into the room and remove it from me. You know, um, so um, and that leads me now to sort of just the, the a couple of little uh, current uh, observations and um of our crazy times i went uh, grocery shopping the other day and the new protocol and you know standing you know uh social distance and on the marks and all of that stuff but when i left here in this condo building they've got uh, sanitizer you know the little receptacles uh downstairs in the lobby and in the second lobby and you've got to go to the underground and go from this uh parking lot to that lock parking lot and every few you know there's, there's sanitizers all over so i'm walking along and i'm like ah hand sanitizer you know then i'm going oh bathroom i go wash my hands and i'm like i gotta go from hand sanitizer to bathroom to sink to and i was kind of going kind of plotting out oh i know where i can stop to wash my hands you know so, but uh, it actually went fairly well, I and mean, you know people are following the, the, the protocols, and there was you know it went actually uh, pretty smoothly, you know. Uh, and uh, the final thing, toilet paper. I uh, I hadn't bought toilet paper since uh, since BCC because you know I don't use all that much. My cat uses the litter box, but uh, and I've heard about all the toilet paper stuff, so you know I'm down to two rolls. So uh, my first stop was Trappist Drug Mart, and they didn't have any. No toilet paper, no paper towel, and then I went to Sobeys for some other shopping, and no toilet paper, you know. And then I stand in line, I go to the third place, I stand in line at uh, um, No Frills, I get in, and I was so thrilled. They had toilet paper, they had paper towel, and I'm like, I was joyful, and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, toilet paper, and I'm like, going, yeah. These are crazy times, you know. So, um, uh, I think I'm going to now go and watch uh, Narcos on Netflix. So, um, which I'm sure everyone else is uh, sitting at home watching Netflix. So, um, see you at the next podcast. As always, stay safe and add oil. Bye for now.